Okay, thank you. Welcome everyone here this evening. Uh, we are lesson 10. Uh, so this is the first lesson on the second article of the Apostles' Creed. So we finished up um, the first article last week. And so uh, today we'll be focusing on the second article and about Jesus Christ and justification. All right, let's go ahead and begin uh, with prayer. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this uh, time to gather in your word, and uh, pray, Lord, that uh, you may uh, bless our studies, uh, bless the, uh, the teaching, bless the questions, and that um, all may be uplifted. Uh, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, second article of the Apostles' Creed, uh, again, centers on Jesus Christ, uh, the God-man. So... Um, okay, so, uh, so second article, uh, is, and I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. So what does this mean? It means that I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. Okay, And it's those words there that we'll be focusing in on uh, this evening. But uh, I'm just going to finish reading the second, uh, the, the meaning to the second article. Uh, so... Jesus Christ, my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost con condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence and blessedness, just as he has risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. Okay. The central thought here uh, on page 164, uh, Jesus once asked, who do people say that I am? He received a lot of different answers. Uh, what do people today think of Jesus? Who or what do they say that he is? So what do people say that Jesus is? Unfortunately, non-existent. A lot of people, you know, there's okay. a sad turn on him, but... Okay, like he is just a myth? Right. Okay, so Jesus the myth. Okay, Andrew? Some, some people falsely believe that he's just a good teacher. Okay, just a good teacher. Okay, what are some other ones? Just a prophet. Okay, just a prophet. Okay, what else? Just a man and not God. Okay, a lot of these are kind of getting to the point where he's just a man, not really God, right? So, yeah, he's just a prophet. He's just a good teacher, right? Uh, what else do people say? Well, uh, some would uh, have said that Jesus is maybe the first of God's creation, but he's not truly God. Uh, that's that's uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Mormons, Jesus is just one God among many in a, in a pantheon of gods. And, and, and I think that's kind of where people today kind of put Jesus is kind of in that pantheon where he's just one of many places you can go to for help, right? Uh, we hear the uh, people say, all roads lead uh, to heaven, right? Um, I, I, I came across a, a picture uh, that says all roads lead to the sun, S-O-N. And it's just kind of the same thing. All roads lead to heaven, right? And, and that's really a lie, you know. Uh, Jesus says something very different about who he is. Um, well, let's look up John 20, 24 through 29. Note what Thomas concludes about Jesus. So... John 20, give a, a, a little bit of a context. Uh, we, we read this about a month ago, ago in, the, in the worship service. 
Uh, it, it's the text that usually, one of the texts that usually comes up uh, the Sunday after Easter, and uh, it talks about uh, Jesus appearing to his disciples, and then who's missing? Thomas. Thomas. <laughs> and so uh, a week later, uh, um, Jesus appears again, and Thomas is with them, right? Now, what did Thomas say beforehand? Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and figure in there, put my hand inside, I will not believe, right? All right, so uh, someone want to read this, this uh, text first. Uh, John 20, verses 24 through 29. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the door, doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Okay. So, what, what does Thomas finally conclude? What does Thomas finally conclude about Jesus? He's Lord and God, right? And, and, and that's a, a, a big thing, right? Uh, because when you think of Lord, it, it's often equated with God. And, and the, um, one of the reasons Christians were persecuted so heavily uh, in, in the early church is that Caesar won that title of Lord because he also wanted people to worship him. Caesar uh, had God complex, okay? He, 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 he really thought... That he was a god, descended from gods, the Caesars, the, the rulers of the Roman Empire should be worshipped. And of course, the Christians wouldn't, right? Because there's only one Lord and one, one God, okay? So uh, these two phrases are very significant, okay? Um, okay, so, uh, so we talk about Jesus, we're going to talk about, there's a number of things to talk about. So we talk about Jesus being true God. He has begotten the Father. This is his divine nature, right? Uh, this is uh, the Son of God from eternity, eternally begotten from the Father, okay? And then in time uh, is the incarnation. He is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, right? So he is then also true man, born of the Virgin Mary. So he, he receives his human um, body and stuff from his mother, okay? And so in the person of Christ, because Jesus is simply one person, right? You have uh, you have Jesus, both true God and true man, okay? And that's significant. Um, you know, I, I often see, I've seen Christian, especially the last few years, uh, when they talk about Jesus, they talk about, they, they portray him in some of the movies and stuff as someone who is almost clueless, as if he doesn't really know who he is, and he's just kind of, it's kind of being revealed to him that he has a godlike stature, you know. Um, I forget the name of it. Uh, Roma Downey and her husband was uh, was part of the producers for that. Uh, guy. do you remember the name? The Young Messiah? It was different than that, but that might be a newer one, huh? Um, Son of God. Son of God, I think that was it. You know, and they, they just had this idea that Jesus isn't, you know, uh, he doesn't really know who he is. And it's almost goes back to this, um, a, a heresy called adoptionism, in which they said Jesus is just man, but the spirit of the Son of God comes upon him in his flesh. Okay? As, as an ancient heresy called adoptionism. And that was really rejected by the early church fathers because it really denies that Jesus is truly divine. Okay? 
uh, and, and this, this, these portrayals of uh, in this, the Son of God in that movie kind of is portraying this kind of Jesus. He doesn't really know who he is, okay? Um, but the Bible makes it clear, Jesus is true God, true man. You know, he, that means he is all-knowing, all-powerful, right? And yet there's times when in his ministry where Jesus seems surprised or Jesus uh, uh, died. So how do we explain that? Well, Jesus didn't always use his divine powers, right? Uh, he did suffer and die for, for us. Um, and so sometimes it might seem like he was surprised. Like he was surprised at the centurion's faith. Um, but now, as the exalted Christ, he is always using those divine powers. So he is omnipresent, present everywhere. Okay, he's all knowing, all powerful, and all these things. Okay, so these are just kind of a various aspects of who Jesus is. Uh, <clears throat> so in the uh, Creed talks about uh, that he is my Lord, that he has redeemed me with his holy and precious blood, right? Uh, what's he redeemed me from? Sin, death, and the power of the devil. Why? That I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him. And then finally, just as he has risen from the dead and lives and reigns for all eternity, I will also rise and live with him for all eternity as well. Okay? All right. Um, came across... Uh, this is a, a interesting book uh, by the by Pastor Trevor Sutton. Uh, it came out a few years ago. It says, "Why should I trust the Bible?" Um, and he's kind of uh, making the case that you can trust the Bible in this. But he had this interesting uh, phrase. He says, "The good news of Jesus Christ entirely reshapes your past, your present, and your future." Okay, so. Before we tackle that, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? <laughs> I'm just going to let some of the older adults answer those mm -hmm. first before you let the kids. <laughs> well, that's true, but so is the law. What is the gospel? It, this, is, this is heart and central to being a Christian. Yes. It is the good news of what God has done for us and is still doing for us in Christ Jesus. Okay, it's all centered on Christ, right? So it's God's work of redemption, his work of salvation for us, okay? It's all about God's work for us. That's the gospel. As soon as I try to put some sort of working of my own into this, then it becomes the law, right? Now remember, we, we talked about the law. What's the law? What, what, how do we find, define the law? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, right? And then uh, along with that, we talked about the three uses of the law. Okay. Now, what were the three uses of the law? Curb, guide, and mirror. The curb, the guide, and the mirror. Okay. So as a curb, what does the law do? Stops us, you know, restrains us, just like a bump, uh, car wheel going up to the curb. It stops the car from going any further. And so you talk about the law of God, whether it's uh, telling us what we should be doing to keep us from doing the, the, that, that evil, or, or like in society, the, the law of God is also uh, permeates throughout government. So there's laws against murder, and if there is, well, then you're going to get... If you're murdering people, you're going to be arrested and you're going to be thrown in jail, right? You're going to be stopped. So there's that first use of the law. Uh, second use of the law is a mirror. So what's the mirror? Reflects what you're doing back to it. Okay. And it reflects specifically what about what we've done? Our sins. Our sins, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, you ever go to, you know, the department store and you're trying on clothes, right? Yeah. Do you like what you see in the mirror many times? No. No? Because <laughs> in that light, it's not the most flattering light, right? <laughs> well, in a way, that's kind of what the law does for us. It reflects that unfortunate. 
fa flavor, uh, not favorable. Favorable, favorable light upon us. It shows us our sins, right? And the more honest we are with ourselves, the more we see our sins, uh, the greater we see our sins. Now, the now the more of a bigger sinner that I am, the bigger savior I need, right? Because if I, if I see myself as just a little bit of a sinner, then maybe I just need a little bit of a savior, right? But I need to see, just be honest with myself and see that I am a great sinner, but yet Christ is a great savior who has paid that price, right? So that gets into the, the gospel there, with, you know, that like Jesus is my savior. He has redeemed me. He's paid the price for my sins. I couldn't do it, but Jesus could, and he did for us. Now, what's the third use of the law then? And we talk about that as a guide. What does that mean? It, it shows us how we are to live. Okay, it shows us how, how, we, how we are to live, right? So, you know, the, the Ten Commandments in, in, in the Old Testament, they were descriptive statements uh, describing what it looks like to be the people of God. Okay? And so uh, we are people that have no other gods. We don't misuse God's name. We remember the Sabbath day. We honor our, our parents. We do not murder, do not steal, commit adultery, uh, bear false witness uh, or coveting. This is the work of the Spirit in us, right? And we'll kind of get into that a little bit more uh, when we get to the third article of the Creed. But I, I just kind of want to restate what the gospel is, right? The gospel is all about Jesus Christ. Christ and what he has done, what God continues to do for us, okay? So, um, you know, so we talked about grammar and verbs, right? Who remembers what verbs are? <laughs> you guys have to, you're, you're still in school. <laughs> a verb is an action word, right? Yeah. So it is, it's, uh, so a verb, is, okay, you have a verb and a noun. You know, and the not is the noun doing is the what doing the action upon the subject, right? So, if 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 you say like the word love, for instance, is the word love law or gospel? Gospel. Hmm. Okay. Oh. Command to love would be yeah, well, yeah, okay, uh, it could be both. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is both. It's both. It is both. Yeah, it's both, isn't it? Because what's the summary of the law? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Or just down to one word, the summary of the law is, is love. So if, if we're talking about a com command that we are commanded to love, if I'm the one doing the loving action, then it is law. Okay. And the law tells me that I'm always falling short. Okay? Even, even if I'm doing the good that God wants me to do, I'm still falling short. You know, Luther would say, you know, I not only confess my sins, but I also confess my good works. Because even my good works are always tainted by sin. Right? On the other hand, when we talk about love and respect for God, that God is the one doing the loving, like John 3.16 right, um, then it is gospel because it's God's action towards us, okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, keeping the definitions of law and gospel clear, <laughs> the goodness of Jesus Christ entirely reshapes your past, your present, and your future. What does that mean then? How does the gospel reshape your past, your present, and your future? And maybe just let's just tackle the first one. How does it tackle your past? How's or how does it reshape your past? Lead you to not do the things you have done in the past, or helps you guide you in a better direction than making the same mistake twice. Okay, is that law or gospel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not to be too much of a stickler on this, but we're talking about you know it's the good news, it's the gospel. Mm -hmm. How does the gospel reshape my life? He came and saved us at baptism. Okay, he comes and saves us, okay? Um, so there's baptism. You can also even talk about in the past where Jesus dies on the cross for us, right? And he uh, pays the price for sins and uh, saves us. And then he 
those those uh, fruits of the cross are delivered to us in, in baptism, right? And for many of us, that is still part of our past, right? Now, is baptism just something that happened in the past? Daily. It's a daily thing, right? You know, Luther says, you know, uh, Christians shouldn't say, I, I was baptized, but I am baptized. Because it's, a, it's that present tense, that continuing uh, remembrance of our baptism, continuing going back to the font, in a sense, where we drown the old Adam that the new man in us may rise live before God, right? So the gospel reshapes our past through baptism, but also in baptism, it's still reshaping our present, isn't it? Right? It has continued to shape us. Yes. So then what does that mean for my future? How does the gospel reshape my future? Because Christ rose, we will rise. Because Christ uh, rose, we will rise, right? So there's eternal life, you know? And again, what's there in the future is still here in our present, right? Because in the past, when we were baptized, we received the gift of eternal life, which continues to be ours right now in the present, and is ours in the future, right? So you see how the gospel reshapes who we are. It reshapes our past, our present, and our future. And, and this then will get into identity, right? Uh, uh, our identity as God's people and who we are. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, all right. Um, I, like, I like this one, too. They had a number of these pictures, and I really like this next quote. It says, The Bible is one continuous confession that Jesus is Lord. Okay? Uh, and that's uh, kind of, that really gets to our, um, um, where we want to kind of start into the catechism here. Uh, what does it mean that Jesus is the Lord of my life? You know, when people say Jesus is Lord, how are they meaning this? What, what, what's often thought about when Jesus, when they talk about Jesus as Lord? Can you cheat and look up there? <laughs> well, it, it's there, so I, mean, I guess it's up to you if you want to cheat or not. <laughs> Think about um, so, and some of the other Christian uh, traditions and, and everything. Where you, you they always emphasize, is Jesus the Lord of your life? And, and what do they mean by that? I always scratch my head. What do they mean by that? And, and I, I, I think they typically mean what the old simple flesh in me will typically think, is that it, it, that word Lord is kind of a law word, right? It, that he is there to to rule and to, to dominate, uh, that, um, you know, he's kind of like a taskmaster. Isn't that how people often think of Jesus? It's that taskmaster, someone who have, you have to please. Now that, uh, especially in Luther's day, was really um, prominent in the Roman Catholicism. You know, Jesus is a stern judge, right? Uh, in evangelicalism today, uh, it is, yeah, Jesus, Lord, my life, and I need to be li living a pleasing life to him. And so my life, uh, by the purpose of living, is to be pleasing to him. And, it's, and it's, it's almost like, yeah, I know Jesus died in the past for my sins, but I still need to be part doing what I need to because I have a part in my salvation. That what I do contributes some way to my salvation. Okay. Now, Luther, uh, he, I mean, he says that, you know, I believe Jesus Christ, true God, begotten the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. Is that what Luther's getting at? Is Luther talking about this as a law word, the word Lord? No, he's not, is he? No. Um, so, uh, you know, the word Lord, as Luther's using it, and as uh, Thomas was using because Thomas wasn't using it in a kind of a taskmaster kind of way. He goes, oh, he didn't say, oh no, my Lord, my God. 
But he said, my Lord and my God, right? Is a, is, a, is a wonderful acclamation of who he is and what he's done for him. And, and that's what, really what we're getting at here. Uh, Lord is a gospel word. Uh, it's a synonym of redeemer. Okay? Because as Lord, he rescues us. He recovers us. He makes us his own. And he brings us to the Father. Um, <coughs> excuse me. He uh, brings us into his kingdom, right? And so when we, now when we talk about Jesus reigning in our lives, it's not in a domineering way, right? Uh, I mean, Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The reign of God, in other words, is at hand. The reign of God in your life is at hand. <laughs> So what distinguishes Christ reigning in our lives in a gospel way versus a law way? You know, a law way is easy. You know, you must do this, you must do that, and you must do the other thing. When Jesus is reigning in our lives, what does that look like? I'll give you a hint. Gospel. <laughs> it, it means life it means salvation it means that i that he brings me and makes that image of god in me new again um that um i i live according to how god has created me right i start to live according to god's will Okay. Now, that's law, but it's third use law. But it, that third use law comes from the gospel, right? It's that fruit of the gospel in my life, if that makes sense, right? Um, so God, Christ reigning in my life is always in that gospel way where, uh, you know, I, I'm sinning and, and that word of law comes to me. It, it crushes me, but... Christ comes also through the gospel and does his work in my life to bring about repentance, to bring about new life, bring about the forgiveness of sins, to rescue me from that old decrepit way of life and to turn me to uh, how God would have me live because that's a better way to live, right? Uh, you know, when, when I'm living according to my own vices and, and my own virtues, life doesn't work out very well. But when I live according to God's will, then it, it does. So it's kind of like a, a little like like a like a computer in a sense. You know, you you fashion a computer, you make a computer, you program a computer to function a different way. But what happens if uh, you get an error in the programming? You, you it doesn't function right, right? Mm -hmm. And if, you, if anybody knows anything about computers, there's always errors in them <laughs> because they were married by fallible human beings. But generally speaking, a computer does what it was designed to do. But when you get an error in the programming, it ceases to do those things, right? And isn't that what sin does for us? Uh, uh, you know, uh, God creates us in his image, but sin comes and it, it corrupts us. And just like a computer, like a faulty programming, and we don't function right. And we have billions and billions of people in the world who are not functioning right. They're not functioning according to how the, the Creator has designed them. And that's why Jesus Christ came. You know, He came to restore them. You know, what, what was the alternative? He could have uh, took them all up and just threw them, in the, threw them and us into the garbage, right? He could have started everything over from scratch, but He didn't. Why is that? Andrew? Because he loves us. Because he loves us, right? And because he loves us, he his work in us is all about uh, bringing us to the point where we function as he created us to be. Now, this side of heaven is always going to be a mixed bag, right? But when Christ returns, it, it will no longer be a mixed bag. We will perfectly function as God created us to be. And God created us to live forever. You know. Um, everybody dies at a young age. In this world. Because 
no one was meant to die. Okay. All right. Does that make sense? Okay. I didn't lose anybody. Okay. All right. So, um, question 148 then. Um, uh, what does it mean to confess Jesus the Lord? It means to acknowledge that he rules over all things as our creator and redeemer and that Jesus is the Lord God himself, uh, Yahweh in the flesh. Okay, so Romans 10, 9 through 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So why do I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord? Jesus has given me eternal life and taken me under his eternal care and protection. Okay, again, that's the gospel definition uh, of Jesus as Lord. Okay. Um, so who then, uh, question 150 is, who is this Jesus that I confess as my Lord? Well, he is the eternal Son of God who entered human history, born, born, born as a man with a body and soul in fulfillment of God's Old Testament promises. Thus, he is both creator and creature, God and man in one person. Okay? And so when you think, talk about Jesus Christ, um, we make that distinction between his divinity and his humanity. But we, we know that, you know, I don't pray to Jesus the human or Jesus the, the God. I pray to Jesus the person, and that and one person is Jesus Christ, God and man. Okay. Um, okay. So, what does it mean uh, the confess that Jesus is true God? Well, the Son of God is the very same uh, sense that the Father is God, namely, He existed from all eternity, and together with the Father and the Spirit, created the entire universe and everything in it. So, you know, we talked about in the first article, the Father with creation. Uh, and, uh, but you know, all three persons of the Trinity are involved there. You know, in Genesis, uh, one verse two, it talked about the spirit of God hovering over the waters. Uh, in John one verse three, uh, it says all things were made through him, the word, and the word is who? Jesus. Jesus, right? Uh, and without him was not anything made that was made. Okay. So, you know, we talk about the Father, his, his work of creation, the Son as the work of redemption, the, and the Holy Spirit, his work of sanctification, and, and, and those are helpful things. Uh, but yet, at the same time, we, we realize all three persons of the Trinity are active and at work in all three areas as well. Does that make sense? Uh, so how's the Father involved in the second article of the Creed? Well, he's the one who sends the Son. Right. Um, so same thing with the uh, with uh, sanctification. You know, uh, the spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Okay. So, so you know, it's like when I pray to God, who am I praying to? Well, I'm praying to the Father. I'm praying to the Son. I'm praying to the Holy Spirit. Right. We make those distinctions because the Bible does, but we know if I'm praying to the Holy Spirit, I'm praying to all three persons of the Trinity. And I, I don't need to sweat who I'm talking to, right? Because I'm talking to God. <laughs> That's why in the person of Jesus, we, when we're praying in, uh, in, in Jesus or to Jesus, we're, we're still praying to God because he is God and man in one person. Okay? All right. Uh, so what does it mean to confess that Jesus is begotten of the Father from eternity? Um, so the Son has no beginning, uh, uh, he eternally receives life from the Father. Thus, in the Nicene Creed, we confess that he, uh, that Jesus has begotten, not made. Okay. So, again, uh, uh, here uh, we're talking about Jesus as far his as his divinity, right? That he's eternally begotten from the Father. Okay. Um, so the the Nicene Creed. Uh, says there, or in the paragraph, uh, says the Nicene Creed also says that the Lord Jesus, that says of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. So this substance of the Father, it, this emphasizes his unique 
as, as the second person of the Trinity. But yet he is still of the same substance as the Father and of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And there's been a lot of different heresies uh, that came out that really tried to diminish who Jesus is. That somehow he's just some sort of human being, maybe a superhuman being or whatever, uh, and not truly God. Okay. And uh, so then that starts to undermine such things as our hope in our salvation, right? Because if Jesus wasn't truly God, then his life, I mean, how could he pay for the sins of the entire world, right? At best, as a perfect human being, he could only pay for one. But as God, he could pay the price for all sins. If Jesus wasn't truly man, what sort of effect does that have on our salvation? <laughs> well, if Jesus was a truly human, what difference does that make for me then? You know, if he wasn't truly human, then did he really live that perfect life for me? Did he really, uh, did anything that he did really matter for me? Not really. You know, he had to be truly human so that he could suffer and die in my place. Right? And again, as God, then he could, he could die in the place of all human beings. Okay? So, was there ever a person in this world that Jesus didn't die for? No. no. It includes people like Hitler and Stalin. Some of the most grievous people we can think of. But yet, God's love for them was still great that he sent his son for them. Now, they reject him. But still, God, in his love, sent his son. You know, even despite that. Okay. So again, it starts to get a bigger idea of God's love for us too, right? Any questions up to this point? I've been kind of rambling on here. Okay. All right. So what does it mean to confess that Jesus is true man? Well, he is human uh, in the very same sense that we are human. Except without sin, right? Um, so, Hebrews 4, 4, 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Okay. Now, you talk about Jesus' temptations in the desert and, you know, Satan's temptations in the desert. Did, were those the only times Jesus was tempted? No. I mean, throughout his ministry, Satan tried to put roadblocks up. One of them being when uh, he says, well, some man must, you know, he asked the question, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Okay, you get an A for that, Peter. Uh, <laughs> now the son of man's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to suffer and die. Oh, no. That's not for you, Lord. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Right? For you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. You know, Satan was always trying to derail. Of course, he's bound to fail, but he's always trying to derail Jesus. So Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted, uh, but he he lives his life and doesn't give in to those temptations. Okay, because being tempted isn't sin, right? Temptation isn't sin. Giving it to temptation—that's <laughs> the sin. <laughs> that's the sin. Okay. Okay, so because Jesus created, uh, or I'm saying, because God created the first man, Adam, without sin, so Jesus' likeness does not diminish his full humanity. You know, so Jesus is that perfect picture of who we should be and who we will be. You know, so First John three uh, talks about how uh, you know we will see him as he is, for we will be like him. As, and he's talking about the resurrection on that last day. We will see Jesus for who we, as he is because we will be like him. That's just an amazing, amazing thing, isn't it? All right. Um, so what does it mean to confess that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit? Well, Jesus was conceived in Mary's womb uh, by the will and the act of God apart from a human father. So again, it's just simply talking about how God uh, brought about this miracle 
uh, of the of the uh, incarnation and uh, in, in Mary's womb. And uh, again, that that's something that's spoken by the word, right? The angel gives that announcement, and it's through that word that the Holy Spirit goes and conceives and and and, uh, and you have the incarnation of Christ. Okay. Okay. So questions and applications then. Is, um, uh, what do we call the event in which the Son of God became man? Again, we call it the Incarnation. Uh, the great mystery that the true God, the true Son of God, who created the universe, created his, entered his creation and became part of it by becoming man. So this is simply what we mean by the Incarnation. Uh, the, the eternal God becomes man. Okay? Becomes man. Um, so how does the Incarnation take place? The Holy Spirit fashioned from Mary's from for Mary, a true human body and soul for the Son of God. It says, note here in the Athanasian Creed, <clears throat> uh, speaks of the incarnation, um, that he is uh, uh, God, begotten for the substance of the Father before all ages. He is man, born the substance of his mother before uh, mother in this age. And although he is God and man, he is not two, but one Christ, okay? Uh, not by the conversion of the divinity into the flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. Well, that's kind of a funny phrase. Of, you know, things. What does that really mean? What does that mean? Anyone want to take a stab at it? <coughs> Excuse me. Andrew. He took on our human flesh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this isn't a way of saying he took on our human flesh, but uh, the divinity wasn't convert into the humanity, right? The divinity continues to remain, and, and the hu humanity wasn't converted into divinity, right? So in these two natures of Christ, being true God, true man, um, you know, you have that one person of Christ, okay? And um, so you have... Uh, what theologians will call a, a communication of attributes, right? We keep the divinity distinct, we keep the humanity distinct, but they're one, one in, in the person of Christ. And so the, the attributes of the, the divinity get communicated or to the divinity or to humanity and vice versa. So we can say when Jesus dies on the cross, God dies, the Son of God dies. Even though the divine can't die, but yet in Jesus, he does. Right. Um, when G when we say Jesus is everywhere, we're not just talking about his divinity, right? But his flesh, his human body, is everywhere. Okay, especially where he promises to be, namely the Lord's Supper, right? Because the the right hand of God isn't a physical place, is it? No. It, it is a, a, a place of, uh, I guess, a place of power, a place of authority, right? Kind of, you have your, your right-hand man, uh, you know, and uh, so it's a place of authority. And that's what we'll talk about on Sunday, because uh, who knows what tomorrow is? Don't say Thursday, please, don't say Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's Thursday. <laughs> what is it? Ascension. Ascension Day. What's Ascension Day? Jesus went up to heaven. Jesus went up to heaven, right? Okay. I want to hear from you guys. I want to hear from you. How many days after Easter is tomorrow? 40. 40. When's Pentecost? 50. 50 days after Easter, right? So 10 days prior to Pentecost. Okay. So Jesus ascends into heaven. Why? Well, to go and to fill all things, to, to go and, and receive all power and authority. Of course, all power and authority is given to him uh, according to his humanity. Because as the Son of God, he had all power and authority, right? But according to his humanity, Jesus receives that. And he ascends into heaven so that he could be with his church. Okay? And um, because Jesus isn't gone, he's always with his church. And, I, you know, I've, I've seen theologians talk about, like, the book of Acts, uh, you know, Acts of the, uh, is often short for Acts of the Apostles. 
but uh, some theologians say, you know, maybe it's better to say it's the acts of Jesus Christ to the church because it's all centered on Jesus. You read the book of Acts, it's all about Christ who is directing his church, uh, working through his church. He hasn't left his church, right? But he goes to fill all things so that he can be with his church in, in, in a way in which he, he wasn't a, uh, he wasn't during his uh, time here on earth uh, during his ministry. Because he was at a particular place in Jerusalem or Caesarea. Yes. But now he is everywhere. 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 And again, that's talks about, you know, during his humiliation, during his ministry, he chose not to use all of those divine attributes, right, according to his humanity. Now he does. Now he does. So you, so you think about that. Now, Jesus as a man, as a human being, as a, as a creator, or as a creation, rises up to heaven to the highest place, to the throne of God. What does that mean for you and me? What does that mean about our identity and who we are? You know, um, I mean, I, I think we often think about, oh, we're going to heaven, and maybe I'll be given a harp and playing the harp or something, and maybe get some wings, which really, really that's false doctrine. That's saying you're becoming an angel. That's not what Scripture teaches at all, right? Um, but because uh, Jesus is Lord and King over all, he has raised up us as the body of Christ. He has raised up humanity that was created as the crown of God's creation and has given us everything. Everything is ours in Christ. And so you've heard me say, and maybe you scratch your heads, that we are not just sons and daughters of the king, but we are also kings and queens in our own right. We rule over all things, even right now. How do we rule? As Christ rules, by loving one another, by serving, by caring. You know, that's how we, we serve, okay? And I'll get into that a little bit more uh, on Sunday. But if we really stopped and thought of what that incarnation means, it means so much more than what we typically think about, okay? And what I think gets categorized, you know, I mean, catechism is a wonderful uh, tool and, and, and teach, uh, book to teach from, but sometimes we compartmentalize these things so much that don't necessarily are meant to be compartmentalized, <laughs> right? And, and, uh, just, and just stopping to think, what does that mean for me? How does that gospel reshape my past? in my present, in my future. Because that's just another aspect of that, right? And isn't the, isn't the fun of the scriptures to delve into what that means, what the death and resurrection of Christ really means for my life? I mean, the big things is life, big things is forgiveness of sins, but that is just, there's that and so much more. How are we doing on time? Mm, it's 7.55, but um, okay. like 10 minutes. 7.55, okay. Um, lost my page here. Okay, well, um, question 158 says, what does it mean for us as human creatures that the Son of God has become our brother? You know, you know, Jesus is our brother because he's also taken on our humanity, right? So that's what it means. He's become man for us. He shares in our humanity in all things except for sin. So that now we, sh we share in his life. He, again, he's exalted humanity, human flesh up, and he has taken us with him. And so when we talk about baptism, we drown the old sinful flesh the new man that comes forward is this exalted 
uh, identity that we have in Christ, you know, and even though we struggle with sin yet in this world, this is who we truly are and who we will be when Jesus returns, okay? So, um, all right. So, uh, we talk about that, um, that he's our brother. He also has shared in our humanity. He has a human body and soul. Uh, he has a human sex. He is male, okay? Some people try to confuse that these days, too, okay? They, they, they are. Um, Jesus has human needs and feelings, okay? Uh, he fasted four days and four nights. He was hungry. He, he wept. He was thirsty, you know, all those kinds of things. So why is it important for us as sinners that the Son of God has become our brother? Well, as our brother, he has fulfilled the obligation to keep the law on our behalf, right? Uh, we, where we failed, Jesus kept that perfectly. And so we call that active obedience. This is Jesus' active obedience where he actively obeyed the law and kept the law perfectly for you and for me. Okay? Uh, the second part is that Jesus suffered and died to pay the penalty for our sins. This is his passive obedience, okay? So as he is on the cross, he is passively obedient by taking on the sins um, of the world upon himself, right? Um, and then C, um, he overcame death so that we too uh, will be raised from death on the last day. All right. Um, I think we're going to stop there and pick it up and, and get into the second uh, part next week. Um, let's see here. Let's go ahead. Any, any, any questions, I guess, before we... A lot to chew on. A lot to chew on. Okay. <laughs> you, you chew it on for a week and come back, and we will pick it up again next week, okay? All right, let's pray. Uh, Lord Jesus Christ, begotten of the Father from eternity, also the true man, born of the Virgin Mary, we give you thanks that you have become our brother. Give us confidence and boldness to confess you as our Lord, and so live and die within your loving care. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right. God's blessings on your week.